Now I'm just thinking about this tension between the kind of more than human or rather as well as human geographies of this riverscape and this walk and the, the thinking through of the troublesome definition and marking the source and the end of the river but never really say the end of the river do we there's the, the estuary which implies this kind of zone of transference from one body of water to another there's the mouth of the river which suggests this kind of gaping hole sort of outpouring sort of always on the move this less much less static thing than saying source where a source of course is a kind of pulling in a gathering in rather than just starting from that point it's taken something to to get things emerging from there I'm just walking up to a gate now actually it's starting to leave the river behind and this is where it joins the road I think for a little way then comes back off the road and once I've done that I'm nearly imbued anyway Anyway, I'm just so yeah, I'm just thinking that through really. And I think it's important to recognise this as a kind of I don't know if tension is the right word, I keep using that word, and I don't think it's right. It's kinda of, it's not a conflict, it's not a tension, it's just just an awareness of Oh, there's a little mole, a little dead mole. Poor little thing. Never actually seen a mole. And now there's one here, dead on the path. Nevertheless, it's kind of evidence of the non-human life around here. So yeah, I'm thinking that through, and it's, uh, like I say, not a tension or conflict, but kind of recognition, I guess, of what the difference is for the human within this effective ecology. You know, my body's a body on the move, and as is the river, as are the non-human animals that are around, and the plant life, and... Even the sediments that's getting transported in the river are all bodies on the move. But there's, I think it's important to think about the fact that as a human body on the move, like for instance, I've just come past the sign for Beaudley at two and a quarter mile, which kind of pushed me on. A uh, short time after that, the alarm went off, so I had to stop and write for a little while. And after that kind of cathartic process of sitting by the river and writing for only 10 15 minutes, did a quick sketch and wrote a short account of what was going on. Got back on the, got the bag back on the back. And, um, and then I was kind of suddenly aware that, oh, it's literally only two miles to go now to Beaudley. And, and that gave me a little, a little fizz inside, a little bit of adrenaline. And it's like, that's it. That's that's the difference. That's the thing about being a human on a journey, as opposed to being a non-human, who are kind of 
travelling about by instinct. Yeah, and yes, I guess they kind of have fun travelling sometimes, like I've just stopped here to watch a, a green damselfly dancing around above the, the tall grasses and flowers and this roadside verge. And I think about the buzzards that I've seen and the ducks. And, you know, I, it's a funny one. I guess, yes, they have fun flying. I think fun's the right word. I mean, you see, you know, when red kites hawk each other, chase each other, you know, they, they play, okay? And the ducks, I've seen a couple of ducks flying around and it looks like they're sort of playing. And so, yeah, I guess they have fun. But in terms of any sense of excitement about reaching destination, I think that's kind of questionable. I think that's probably something that's not, not perhaps explicitly human, but there's an effective register working there for the human that perhaps doesn't necessarily work in the same way for animal. I'm being quite careful about how I say this because you can always turn around and people do always or usually turn around and say, well, how do you know? And well, okay, you don't know. But what you do know is that animals are in this kind of harmony with their environment. We take the the Uxorlian sort of approach to it and think about their umwelt. You think about what the destination would mean in a world of perceptions and signs and symbols and signals and signifiers. And what it would be, it would be a register for their perception on their sense organs and their awareness but would it be a kind of pre-personal thing that's kind of emergent and then plays upon their affective registers and their emotional registers and their sensations in the same way as it would for a human? I don't know. And it's funny, you know, I'm approaching Beaudley now and I, I know I'm approaching Beaudley. I've seen a sign, I've kind of quantified it in my mind. I can now really visualise what a sort of two, meet, two miles is. And walking, it's going to take me about another, another half hour to an hour from here. So, you know, I can... I've got this thing in between these markers. It's been quite nice, actually, to kind of lose that awareness of distance. And actually, perhaps, enter back into a world of perception and signs rather than watching a mileometer go around on a car or bicycle or a bus journey broken up by stops. I kind of know how I've been doing time-wise today because I've had the alarm going off every hour. I've then stopped and sat and written for a while, which has been nice actually. And it's been quite odd because as I've approached each hour, I've kind of known that that hour was coming. I've kind of known my sort of inbuilt body clock sort of got in tune with that. And that's another, there's another tutor, the Seven Valley Railway. Probably not going to be able to get a photo of it again. Anyway. So there again is that Exorlian kind of harmony my body's entered into with a kind of sense of time. Even though I've not been clock watching, I don't wear a watch. So humans have the capacity to enter back into, step away from the world of quantified, measurable time, and enter back into an old Bergsonian, Uxorlian, durational living of life. A durational kind of movement without having to know what the distance is or what the time is 
or anything else and actually be quite accurate about knowing how much time has passed without seeing a marker or yardstick or landmark something like that so it's a strange one <laughs> Sorry, I've had to laugh. I've just passed a guy with the most pointless lawnmower in the world. A small electric one with a box on it. He's running it over his long grass. It doesn't appear to be cutting anything. And yet he's still persisting in his endeavour to cut his lawn. There's some quite strange looking little... quite loud when you're close to it. It seems to be running quite regular though, I'm going to try and catch that on Friday. Anyway, I'll keep losing track of what I'm talking about. So yeah, there he comes. He's coming down here in this digger now, I'm just going to step in here while I know I can, yeah, I'll step over here instead. Okay, so yeah, just that, oh, it's a funny one, it's a really strange one. And so while I'm writing this project as a kind of, you know, a decentering of the human, if we then start talking about the agency of non-organic stuff and the perception worlds of animals and things, we also then have to talk about the agency of the human and perception world of the human. Even though we're decentering the human, you know, we're displacing its importance, we're not making it the central locus of agency and actancy and action and power and all these things. But at the same time, we need to recognise the differences. And what I'm thinking is this difference is this sense of journeying. While that doesn't make us, that's not an explicitly human thing, I think, you know, it is a quite a human thing. And it's been something that I haven't really been able to give into. And I find myself, once again, even though I've decided to do case studies for the project and break it down into these chunks, I also still want to and have this desire to walk the full length of the seven. Not in any particular order and not always downstream. But I feel like I should put my body amongst the whole riverscape and journey the whole riverscape. <laughs> 